I'd like to call this meeting to order. Today is Tuesday, November 27th, 2018. This is a study session for the Prescott City Council. Let's please call roll. Mayor Mangarelli. Present. Mayor Pro Tem Orr. Here. Councilman Blair. Yes. Councilman Good. Here. Councilman Lamerson. Here. Councilwoman Scholl. Here. Councilman Sishka. Here. All are present. Thank you. Let's move on to item 3A, please. Presentation on the possible relocation of the downtown Prescott Post Office. Good afternoon. Okay, I'm a representative of the U.S. Postal Service Real Estate Department in Dallas, Texas. And I'm here today to discuss a project that's currently under evaluation or be just being considered at this point in time for the Prescott Downtown Station. It's always our policy to keep government officials in the community updated on any project that may impact them with the local post office. And a meeting such as this public forum will allow me to provide details to the project. Okay, so as part of the discussion today, I'd like to just touch on the legally mandated process we follow when relocating retail services, the core strategies of the organization, as well as a process for public input. Now, the legal mandate that I reference is 39 CFR 241.4. In essence, it requires that we provide public notification to the city officials and the community who may be affected by a project. This process allows for input, which will be considered prior to any final decision being made. Now, the impetus for this project is part of a national effort whereby the Postal Service continually evaluates our current inventory in an effort to optimize the network. As a result, we're always looking for ways to reduce costs, consolidate operations, as well as increase efficiencies. Now, the case in point is the Prescott Downtown Station. This facility is much larger than what is typically, typically required to conduct our ongoing operations. This next slide shows it's a good visual of the ultimate plan. Currently, we're evaluating the possibility of disposing our existing facility which is owned by the Postal Service, and identifying new alternate quarters strictly for our retail operation. Now that facility would only require approximately 32, 3,300 square feet, ideally on a site of about one acre to accommodate roughly 28, 30 parking spaces. Now previously, GSA did occupy or lease about 11,000 square feet of space within the building, the downtown station. They vacated. Attempts were made to ne negotiate agreeable terms, but we were unsuccessful. So right now, we are only occupying approximately 9,000 square feet of space, and the remainder of that building is currently vacant. Now, as I mentioned earlier, anytime we relocate a retail operation, we're legally mandated to follow a specific process. And the steps in this process include, step number one, notification of the project to the mayor, which in fact has been completed. Step number two, notification of the project to city officials and the community at a public forum such as this meeting. Step three, following this meeting, there's a 30-day comment or appeal period. At the end of that period, all comments received will be evaluated before any final decisions are made. And step number four, we'll formalize our decision by sending written notification to the mayor. That notification will also be publicized at the post office. And step number five, we'll the final decision will ultimately be implemented. At this point, we consider our notification process to be completed. Now, once this process is completed, we're at the stage of evaluating the market for potential buildings to meet our specific requirements. Now, right now, the preferred area we're looking in is within a one mile radius of our existing downtown station. The specific parking and space requirements include a building of approximately 3,300 square feet, on a site of approximately one acre to accommodate approximately 28, 30 parking spaces for customers, employees, as well as postal vehicles. So after a thorough analysis, we'll conduct a site selection with postal officials. We'll evaluate all potential sites with the goal of ultimately selecting a site that best meets our needs. Throughout this process, we will continue to keep our channels of communication open and keep you updated. At this point, this slide here tells you where to write, where to send uh, comments or appeals, negative, positive, directly to me, and any media inquiry, inquiries should be directed to our uh, communications specialist. 
And I've got copies of this page, which I'll leave behind. Do you have any questions? I love the length of your presentation. That was awesome. <laughs> uh, questions, comments from the council, Mr. Lamerson. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming for the council. At a different time frame in history, we had a different life. My wife was a procurement officer for GSA, federal government, Plattsburgh, New York. And I understand the area that you're trying to deal with here. Um, at the end of the day, however, I'm an elected official for the city of Prescott, and we're dealing with a historic building in the downtown area. So one of the things that I always go back to is my general plan. And I guess my question <coughs> will evolve around, <coughs> at the end of the day, I know you guys need to move. You, you know, what you have doesn't fit your need. Um, is there liberty to try and work with the city to make sure that the building that you presently occupy has an opportunity to come into um, oversight of the city as to how the disposition takes place? Ultimately, the project will be publicly advertised and it will be competitively bid. Once that occurs, absolutely. I mean, at that point, we, you were looking basically to sole source, is, is that? Not necessarily no. sole okay. source. You know, at the end of the day, you know, we, we all work for the, 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 the same customer, the public. You know, you work for the taxpayer, I work for the taxpayer. You know, the difference is, of course, you, you look at a globally different taxpayer than I do, I look at a very small taxpayer, the city of Prescott, what's in the best interest of the city, and that's where my interests lie. So at the end of the day, what I'm saying is, you know, is there a way to work within the fabric of that comment in the best interest of the city of Prescott, not necessarily globally, in the best interest of somebody out there that just wants to come down and take advantage of who the city of Prescott is in the marketplace? Well, again, it is our policy. The project will be publicly advertised and then competitively bid. So I hear I you loud and clear. I would venture to guess at that point the city would then open up discussions with the Postal Service. Well, the reason for this dialogue is so my fellow council can hear exactly what the process is. Okay? It's, it's not to try and put you on the spot. My wife was procurement officer for probably 11 border stations on the Canadian border, and I understand the, the policy. Okay? Councilman Good. Uh, thank you for uh, bringing this to our attention. Obviously, this is uh, an important building, historical, uh, right across from the courthouse, which is our historical core. Um, but I understand um, the conditions of the Postal Service. How much did you lose last year? It was pretty substantial. Multiple billions, is that correct? That's correct. Um, just if you decide to close this, which you probably will, uh, the, the disposal process will be uh, publicly bid to the highest bidder, right? You, aren't you required to award that to the highest um, qualified bidder? That's not necessarily true. I mean, it's all a, a negotiated process, so it's, it's not a specific mandate that you have to take the highest bidder, no. So you will um, write a bid specification, uh, publicly post that somewhere, and then... Uh, take the qualified bids and then evaluate those and you can potentially decide not necessarily on the highest bidder? That's correct. Um, Postal Service on a nationwide basis has Jones Lang LaSalle on contract with them. So ultimately you will see it advertised either through Jones Lang LaSalle or one of the local representatives here who they may ultimately subcontract with. You may not necessarily see it directly through the Postal Service but it is on behalf of the Postal Service. Your hope is to be able to find a property within a mile that has these requirements, square footage, uh, parking, et cetera, a full, full acre. Have you um, assessed the current market? And are you, um, do you think it's likely you're, you're gonna be, f be able to find what you need? <clears throat> Well, that's two, two questions there. Um, at this point, no, we have not ultimately assessed the market. 
this step in the this is the first step in the process. Once we get through this process, we'll ultimately engage Jones Lang LaSalle. Um, we've brought this project to their attention. They are evaluating the market. They have not delivered any alternatives to us at this point in time. Now, this being a downtown area, there's a lot of on-street parking. Do I anticipate a one-acre site? In all likelihood, no. I mean, on-street parking is a way of life here in this community. so in all probability, we'll also have on-street parking at whatever alternate location we're at. But is there a commitment that somehow, some way, there will be another post office within a mile of the downtown core? Well, that is our focus. We want to keep this retail outlet in this downtown right. area. Now, the Miller Valley location is not that far away. The, I'm sorry, the what location? The current post office on Miller oh, Valley. Oh, the main... But it's still within, our planning team will actually look at the delivery areas. Now again, this is a strictly a retail. It has nothing to do with, there's no uh, carriers within this building. So they, they take a look at that from a, from a carrier standpoint, from a retail standpoint. Um, they're not gonna overlap so that a, a, a new location would impact retail at a nearby facility. They're gonna seriously and carefully Look at that. So describe the services that this new location would provide. Identical services that you experience right now at the current downtown station. Just uh, purchasing stamps and boxes and, and <clears throat> other retail products. Retail products, that's correct. And you will be able to post mail there. Post mail. Post it. You'll be able to put it in a box and have it. Oh, absolutely. Yes, there right. will be P.O. boxes there. I'm sorry. Okay, that's all the questions I have. Thank you. Councilman Blair? Is this, Mr. Lamar, is this building on the National Register? I don't know the answer to that. Is this on the National Register? It could very well be. Being I think we need to find that out. I think we need to find that out first because I think there needs to be protection for this community and our heritage on that corner. Number one. There absolutely will be. I've already been in contact with our um, state historic, well, I shouldn't call it state historic, our preservation okay. um, officer in DC. And to a little bit dovetail on Councilman Blair's question, we've alluded to this location and how important it is to our downtown. As you put together the request for proposals, is there any precedent in other communities that are similarly situated where the local government participated in putting that together? I mean, I guess my point is, this isn't the first rodeo for you guys to repurpose something in a core downtown that's important to a community. Right. Can the local government have any impact on how that looks or goes out to the public? That's usually not our process. What specifically were you referring to? Well, there's obviously, projects that would be more beneficial and less beneficial based on what kind of bid you get. You, know, you said you don't have to take the highest. That's correct. How, what, in what circumstances would you not take it? What, what types of things would supersede money, I guess, is the question. Well, case in point, I mean, we, it's a historic building. We need to be absolutely sure that there are restrictions on this building and somebody's not going to change the historical okay. significance of that building. What about the use and its impact and on the community at large? That is all taken into consideration. Okay, and I guess my point is, does the city have some say in that or participate at some level? Or is that coming in that letter form you're talking about? No, no, no. Th this letter form that I'm referring to is strictly this notification process. But you're asking for comments, and, and should that be a comment that comes from the city of Prescott? Oh. In other words, we have a Absolutely. county supervisor that's sitting in the office as well. And Yapai County happens to be the county seat here in Prescott, Arizona, right here. Mm -hmm. And you know the county may be interested in office spaces and may have a very central service to what we offer in downtown Prescott, which we employ hundreds of thousands of people down here. And to have no say or to be left out on that say, so to speak, is kind of hard for me to believe that the federal government might come in and take somebody else's bid over what's really beneficial to the community. So I want to make sure that we're, our voice is loud and clear here. Well, as I've indicated, first step in this process would be during that comment period. 
in closing, I also indicated we will, as we proceed with this project, continue to keep those channels of communication open. So we will always be communicating. Now, whether we sit down at a table and you dictate how you'd like to see this, uh, this process unfold, that is not customary. But no, we will not close the door on. No, we certainly would never think we could dictate how you dispose of something that you own. We just would like to participate in the process at some level where it's appropriate. There would, there would be no, no reason we couldn't sit down. Plus, we have an opportunity to be able, through our real estate people at the city, be able to help find property as well. We happen to have a piece on McCormick Street that we'd love to unload to you. <laughs> it's within a mile of downtown. Yeah, it's got the parking spots, too. <laughs> Councilman Lamerson. Thank you. And I understand you're not <coughs> from Prescott. <coughs> you know, at the end of the day, thank you for being here. Um, I don't really envy your job. You know, any more than I envied my wife's. But at the end of the day, you know, we work for the same taxpayer. You, you know, going along with Blair and Lamar down here at the end of the table, we serve the community of Prescott. And while I realize that you represent the taxpayers of the nation, at the end of the day, the government's best closest to the people. And what we're trying to talk to you a little bit about what you do in downtown Prescott, Arizona, first territorial capital of the state of Arizona, is going to impact us significantly. That's a major icon building in our town. And the fact of the matter still remains. I would hate to see some sort of a star-spangled, um, oh, those lights that blink and everything, strip club, because they bid a high price in the middle of downtown Prescott. What I'm saying is that at the end of the day, the character and the ambience of the downtown of Prescott is different than maybe you would find somewhere else in Las Vegas. So at the end of the day, I would hate to see the federal government sell to the highest and best user, so to speak, at the cost of the character and the ambience of a very historical community in Arizona. All your points are very well taken, and they will, like I say, before we move too far into this process, we will continually reach out and speak directly with mayor and, and council about the process. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem? Yes, yeah, Sandra, thanks. Thanks for coming. Um, I would just like to say, I kind of reiterate what um, Councilman Blair said, is that we do have someone that works with companies businesses to find sites and she really knows the area very well and hopefully your person can contact her and, and speed the process along when you get to that point. Well, I think actually, it would be very helpful. Actually, how do I get this contact information? Absolutely. Now? We'll, we'll give it to you. Her name is Wendy Bridges Okay. and Wendy could help you find a very, she knows what's available. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. It'd be great. Any other questions, comments from the council? I would like to compliment uh, Councilwoman Orr for bringing up. We're on the same side, okay? Right. We're all taxpayers. We're all residents of the United States. We want to do what's in the best interest of both of us. We really do. So thank you, Billy, for your comments. Yeah, we'll contact. We'll Mayor, get it again with you. <laughs> quick question: Do you, does Council want staff to draft some type of letter? for council's consideration perhaps on the 18th, the meeting of the 18th. That's a great idea. Because their deadline is a month from today, I think, 27th, mm -hmm. um, as sort of the city's official comment, something. I think that would be a smart idea. Thank you, John. Uh, any other questions, comments from the council? Public comment? Oh. I have another question. Oh, go ahead. Um, just to clarify, uh, U.S. Postal Service is a a uh, quasi-governmental organization that's subsidized by the federal government but exists separately uh, and it doesn't have the same federal regulations and restrictions that the, the General Service Administration does. So does that give you some discretion when you're uh, deciding to s dispose of property? Well, there's one point I want to make. We are not subsidized by the federal government. We are, in fact, a quasi-federal government agency, right. but we are not subsidized by taxpayers or the federal government. 
we operate exclusively on the services that we provide, the revenue received from the services that we provide. So in answer to your question, no, or we're not getting You continue any kind of to lose billions of dollars every year, but you continue to operate without subsidies? We are continually going before Congress in an attempt to try and operate right. more like a business right. so we don't have those billions of dollars of losses because we still have mandates that are put on the Postal Service as a result of being a quasi-federal government agency, and that's what's causing some of these losses that we're experiencing. All right. It still sounds like a duck, and it quacks like a duck. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. I'm going to open this up to public comment. We have one speaker card, John Hooker. <coughs> Our family came to Prescott in 1951. I used to live where the public library is now. We've used that post office for many, many years. We tried the new post office, but quite frankly, it wasn't near as good, it wasn't near as friendly as the old post office. So. I look at this this way. The post office funds goes into the federal treasury, the money they make. And the first class mail pays for itself. It makes a profit, actually. But that all goes into the federal fund. And then they dole out what the post office gets to use. And they squeeze. And junk mail does not pay its way. So my suggestion is, let's first make junk mail pay its way. And second, let's not give the feds that money from the post office. Let them keep it and use it to pay their bills. Now that's why the post office is squealing and in trouble and not able to make a profit because Congress and entitlements and all these little projects they have in Washington is taking the money from the post office and not giving enough back for them to operate. So that's a failure of our federal government right there. They're too damn greedy. Another thing I'd like to state on this is that in Europe they use buildings for hundreds and hundreds of years. 300, 400 years, and they're still in use, and they're maintained and kept up. This building of ours has only been in use about, what, 150 years, something like that? It's a young building, and it's a solid building. And I'll tell you all, they don't build buildings today like they used to. So what you build to replace this post office will be much shoddier, much less well-designed, and it won't last as long. Now, they say, oh, we have too much space. If you have extra space, rent it out at a profit. Don't put the building up for sale. Don't let someone come in and tear down a good, solid, landmark building. Put those, that extra space to use and keep that possible post office where it is working as a post office and get on your congressman's tail and tell him to stop robbing the fund of the post office because that's what they're doing. They're stealing. Thank you for your comments, sir. I appreciate that's it. it. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, I really don't like podiums. Um, I'm very familiar with Well, if you could please come to the podium and you have three minutes and then you can fill out a card when you're done. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm not prepared here, but I'm speaking off the cuff. I am uh, very familiar with, we just call it Goodwin, the post office. 
I've been inside and out of that building. I have a knack for getting into places where most people don't. And the historic beauty of it is unbelievable. Have, has anybody been to the courtroom upstairs? It's unbelievable. Then they did, a couple years ago, they did some really stupid renovations, unnecessary renovations. And I'm not talking the windows or the roof. I'm talking about from one, they destroyed a lot of the bathrooms. They had a lot of original fixtures. And they just, for whatever reason, they took those out, even though they weren't really being used, and put in cheap garbage. It looks like from Home Depot. I hope it has, wasn't done in a lot. Um, you call yourself an assets. I dumpster dived. And a lot of those things, oh, oh, oh. Sell, those silly soap dishes and things, sold for hundreds of dollars on eBay. Hundreds. They took out a boiler that, well, actually, they had an old boiler that it was the radiator system. They fixed it, and it worked, and were great. And then a short time later, they took it out, put in a quarter million dollar boiler that didn't work. That doesn't seem very good or very um, prudent. I'm a very thrifty person. That's not prudent. Also, too, why don't you rent out those, building, those offices? They're going to waste. There's great furniture sitting in the back or in downstairs. Mid-century stuff, it would sell. That stuff's very popular. Nice oak furniture, great stuff. It's just going to waste. It's just sitting there. It's just sitting there. It's terrible. It's a tragedy. I think our historic buildings, to use them as they were intended, is very important for the roots of the community. And as far, sir, as the billions of dollars of loss, the majority of that, or a good portion of that, is caused because Congress has put a mort or a, what's the term, not moratorium. Anyway, they require the post office to fund retirement benefits 70 years into the future. So they're having to pay and fund retirement benefits for people who aren't even born yet. Now, isn't that silly? And I don't understand why that is still going on and why that hasn't been fought tooth and nail. Who does that? Only the post office has to pay that. <clears throat> Nobody else does. That's why there's so much billions of dollars. It's not because they're inefficient. It's not because they, are, you know, they don't uh, do enough business. I mean, packages. Who goes shopping anymore? Most of those are gone through the post office. My husband right now is working 12-hour shifts for the Christmas load. So I kind of know what those, off those employees do. Thank you for your comments. Thank you. Councilman Lamerson. Thank you. Uh, Sandra, I would like to address you again. Thank you for being a public servant. Um, at the end of the day, we're not here to dissect you, hon. You're, you're here for a reason. And at the end of the day, the issue is you guys need to sell the building. Are you going to sell the building? Are you going to move it? It's not efficient. My job as a councilman is to figure out what can we work with and how can we work best <coughs> with the federal government on ensuring the building that is, is an icon building for the city stays in to some sort of influence with the city. Um, is there something that can be done at this point? I know you got it by, by procurement code. You've got to put it out for bid. At the end of the day, is there something that we can do to help um, as a city um, set up what it means to bid on that building? That building is something different than let's just make it some sort of a, um, at the lack of a better word, like I used earlier, just, just to pedal it off. But, you know, at the end of the day, we're concerned about this downtown of Prescott, the historical character and ambience of the downtown of Prescott. Is there something we can do working with the federal government that would better position the city of Prescott to work towards procuring that building? I think at this point, the best thing we can do is allow me to coordinate a meeting between the Postal Service representatives and city officials. Thank you very much. You answered that question because we're on the same page. I think it can be had and can be done. Okay, let me work on that. Mayor Pro Tem. So Sandra, I was on the radio this morning with the morning report talking about the agenda items that we have, and this was one of the agenda items. 
And then like half an hour later, I heard a person call into the radio and said, he heard rumors that they're going to tear the building down. So I think it's really important that it be stated here publicly that there is no intention to tear that building down. There is no intention to tear Basically, that Basically, you're talking about relocating the retail service within a one-mile boundary. So I think it's just really important because I, I was astonished. Steve was on the radio, and I, I heard the guy call in, and I thought, no, that's not what was said. So I just think it's important that we get that message out there that we're not talking about this building is not going to be torn down. It will be here long after we're all gone. It's so thank absolutely you. Absolutely not. I'll make note of that. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks again so much, Sandra, for being here. Thank you. All right. And Sandra, I'm sorry, Wendy is in the audience, Wendy Bridges. So great. Okay. Thank you. All right. Let's move on to item 3B, please. Presentation of the water, wastewater, and solid waste rate <coughs> study. Thank you, Murray. <coughs> Excuse me, Mayor and Council, losing my voice. Uh, Mark Woodfell, Finance Director. We've been, yeah, <laughs> be a shame. We've been working um, for the last three months on some very important projects for the city, which include the impact fee study and the rate uh, study for water, wastewater, and solid waste. These are very important. They're going to set the course for the city's infrastructure for the next five years, at minimum, even longer. So it. it these are important means. I know they're no fun. I know they're long. I know they're very exciting with graphs and numbers, which some of us like, some of us don't. Um, we've been working on the impact fee, and that continues on. Uh, we've adopted, the council adopted the infrastructure improvement plan and land use assumptions at the last meeting, and that process is going on concurrently with the rates that we're talking about today. The rates and the impact fees are all driven by capital. And the capital we're talking about today being funded by rates is not for new growth. That, of course, comes from the impact fees. This is the growth that's needed to replace in the existing system and also the improvements that are needed in the existing system. So just to clarify that aspect of this, we have limited today's presentation to just water and wastewater. We took solid waste out just because of time limitations. We didn't want to have to rush and not be able to cover everything. And we're also still working on some proposals for solid waste. With that said, this presentation that we're doing today, because of timing of council, of course, will be on TV and it'll be rebroadcast on TV. But we're also doing another presentation tonight, the same presentation, at 6 o'clock for the public who wants to come down in person and ask questions and um, hear a little bit more. And we're doing it again on the 4th of December. With that, we'll get into the, the presentation. Rate studies in Arizona. Uh, basically set the cap. This is the cap that is justifiable with the expenses that were presented that uh, the council can adopt this cap rate. Doesn't mean the council has to adopt it. Council can give direction through this process and, and, and uh, opt for other rates that meet these needs or even reduce the needs somehow. Uh, this process is ongoing. We got about 58 days, 59 days till the public hearing, but we're going to again have these workshops. We're going to be taking public comment throughout this whole process. So the public hearing is just a statutory formal requirement. With that, um, so we can get to the fun, I will introduce Andrew Reams with Raf Tellis, who is our rate consultant for water and wastewater, and let him take it from here. Good afternoon. Thanks, Mark. Uh, as Mark indicated, the intent really is to provide an update on the preliminary <coughs> recommendations. There's some statutory drivers, public hearing, that are part of the process. So the, these are some initial findings. We're looking for low reaction and just uh, general feedback. Um, and as Mark had indicated, you know, there's a public process that uh, we're gearing up towards and uh, publishing the report in, in it uh, ahead of a, a public hearing before. You know, it's really a, a set of rating, uh, ordinances for uh, council adoption. So <clears throat> the agenda is around water, wastewater, uh, utility, um, and ultimately the preliminary findings. We've, we've structured it. There's a, there's a couple you know, kind of components that cut across both uh, enterprises, both utilities and then uh, kind of dial into the big drivers and uh, what the impacts and uh, the rates may be. Um, we were asked to prepare a five-year schedule. So uh, while often the focus is kind of the near term with uh, the first set of rates proposed to go into effect March 1st of 2019, uh, we, we have prepared a five-year schedule that runs all the way through the last set of increases, January 1, 2023. 
So then over the next, including this one, uh, five fiscal years, uh, we'll talk about both, uh, both utilities, uh, as, as Mark indicated. Uh, while the project's a little different, uh, we're looking at uh, capital projects being a, a big driver for uh, the need to adjust user charges. Um, this is, you know, part of uh, federal government requirements uh, as we're looking at the timing uh, for planning purposes of debt and debt issuances. Uh, this is just sort of remind the city, as, as the city's done in the past, to engage municipal advisors before for formally issuing external debt, whether through WIFA or uh, other entities. Uh, that said, uh, the firm I work for is a registered municipal advisor, and uh, we do this type of thing all the time. Um, so just to set the stage a, a bit before jumping into water, uh, you know, while these two utilities as well as the solid waste utility uh, arrive to most customers on the same bill, uh, they're separate entities, separate enterprises, so uh, as, as the city budgets and tracks them as separate funds, so that's the way we look at them. And uh, we look at water and uh, wastewater and prepare financial plans uh, for each. For each separate uh, utility, we're projecting what the requirements are. And uh, we're starting with you know, adopted budgets, but anticipating things like inflation, cost increases, as well as uh, the big driver being the uh, variable capital projects. You know, while there's a certain amount of capital investment year over year, as you're well aware, there's, there certainly can be big projects and, and one-time uh, recurring needs. And so uh, we're factoring those in, how to fund them. Um, and ultimately, uh, the bolded items, that's, that's from a kind of rate setting standpoint. These are the three things we look at. And we look at, you know, funding expenses. These, you know, are, are entities and enterprises and they've got bills to pay. And uh, there's two additional criteria that uh, factor into rates. One is a debt service coverage requirement. And uh, these are legal agreements that the city in has entered into in the past and anticipates with additional debt through WIFA or other agencies to be required, the financial performance requirements essentially, where uh, we're, we are having to have a certain amount of revenues after O&M to meet uh, debt obligations. And then a, a second related component, which is end of year cash reserve targets. Each of the funds has a number of days of O&M as a, a bare minimum, and so, these three work in tandem, you know, certainly uh, meeting the first one with funding expenses, um, but uh, we've got this little additional criteria where, you know, there's a certain amount of cash we don't want to fall below in, in any year. Uh, and that's, that's ultimately what's, what's driving both plans is, you know, not necessarily operations, operating expenses today, but it's over time as, as we continue to expand the system, uh, more importantly, as Mark indicated, deal with replacements, rehab, one-time projects that uh, uh, we've got some additional needs. So I'm going to start uh, uh, with the water fund. It's going to follow kind of a similar uh, uh, layout between the two, uh, two utilities, um, but uh, we'll, we'll start with water. <clears throat> so in terms of uh, the overall rate objectives, you know, these are very similar as uh, what was evaluated uh, about five years ago with the most previous rate study. Um, but uh, in, in part, we like to level our rate adjustments. Most customers uh, prefer to have more frequent regular adjustments rather than uh, waiting for, you know, kind of us to spend down the money and then need to take a sharp uh, correction, if you will. And so we followed that, and we followed that uh, for the water rate study. Uh, one of the important drivers in the city is to uh, present conservation or water use efficient, efficiency oriented pricing structures. As we, we talked to council and, and got some of the feedback early on in the study in late August, uh, that was some additional direction that was confirmed. And so we've got a rate alternative, a second rate alternative uh, that uh, increases this conservation sort of efficiency pricing signal. And those are gonna be two that we're gonna look at. Um, I mean, ultimately, it comes down to providing a stable source to fund the needs for the water fund, the water enterprise. Uh, and uh, with utilities such as these capital projects often uh, drive the requirements. That's, that's the case within the five-year period we're looking at. Um, we're also evaluating the city's 
has two additional kind of charges, if you will, uh, beyond what I consider more general user charges. Uh, one of them is a flat fee, uh, aquifer protection fee that was put in a few years ago. And another one is an alternative water surcharge, a volume rate that is in addition to, say, the tiered charges we're going to talk about in a minute. Uh, that, that is applied. We're asked to evaluate these and, and we'll talk a little bit more in terms of how this is tied into the overall findings and recommendations. And uh, secondly, there's a, a statutory requirement within Arizona um, where the city serves customers outside the city, both within the town of Chino Valley as well as just the county in general. And that outside city multiplier for the county is uh, currently 1.4 times the inside city rates. Uh, so we've evaluated this as we did back in 2013, and we're recommending a, a modest decrease to this that cuts across both alternatives. So we've looked at these, and, and the final driver is the city has uh, followed a customer class cost of service philosophy for many years. And as part of these periodic studies, uh, that was a big driver for us, and it's tied into the findings for both alternatives uh, one and two. So really set this really sets the stage uh, for uh, what is uh, to follow. And as Mark indicated, now we get into the charts and uh, table part of uh, the discussion. Um, so one option that when we're looking at, at rates, the last point notwithstanding, uh, certainly you know, communities in the city you know, has an option to maintain the existing structure and just certainly uh, uh, across the board uh, adjust the increases, if you will, to meet the revenue needs of the system. And so what this chart shows, the current typical bill for a residential customer that uses 5,000 gallons per month is around $38. And if uh, the, what I consider pretty modest increases in the water fund, uh, two to three percent a year were to just apply it across the board. We didn't change structure at all. We just increased unit prices, aquifer protection fee, alternative water charge. Uh, we'd be looking at about a dollar per month uh, increase each year through uh, each of the five years that uh, we're evaluating. Uh, so this gives just kind of a, a, you know, a metric and a measure to kind of see you know, how these changes sort of coalesce all together. And uh, this tracks out through that full five-year period. Uh, as we're looking at two alternatives, we're in a similar ballpark, but uh, not quite. Are we allowed quite. to ask you questions in the middle? Of course. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> When you talk about evaluating and all the other stuff, delivery of the water, does it justify a dollar a year increase in the price? I mean, as we're t sitting here talking about doing these increases, or a dollar a month, whatever the case was, at the end of the day, does it cost us a dollar more as a community to deliver the water to our customers? They should hear loud and clear, it's costing us at least that much money to deliver their water? It, and the short answer is yes. That's what's driving the increase is the need to fund the expenses. And the expenses are going up both I, primarily I capital. I appreciate that. I mean, at the end of the day, we're not here to subsidize a private water user's water. What we are here to do is reclaim on behalf of the city and all the citizens of the city what it costs us to deliver water to our customers. That That's what we do. I mean, at the end of the day, our people in the water department know what it costs us to deliver the water. And there's no way that we can deliver the water any more than they can go buy the water in the free marketplace for less money than the city is delivering that water. I would agree. <clears throat> um, so uh, on, the, on the point and kind of what the major driver for uh, these increases and you know as we look at the kind of aggregate financial plan where you know the capital projects is a funding amount operating expenses but to really focus in on capital projects for the water fund over uh, the five-year period we're evaluating we're looking at 94 million dollars in capital expenses in total and uh, identified here and you know that's a big number but it, when we break it down, there, there's a handful of significant or major projects that are driving the need for the increase. Here is a summary that, that talks about uh, some of those major projects, identifying the aggregate amount of the project, kind of the timing, and I'll, I'll start and highlight a couple. The intermediate and Chino <coughs> booster pump stations, that uh, is a single project's most significant one in the water fund that we're 
funding and, and planning on funding over the five-year period. It's roughly $23 million, so it's a big portion of that overall uh, $94 million, and uh, it's it's currently happening and, and certainly is planned to you know continue on over the next couple of years. Um, Another question. Sir. Okay, because we get a lot of lip service on a lot of different things, says a public body. <clears throat> growth or no growth, we still have to pay the cost of improving our delivery system, correct? Correct. <clears throat> the, uh, on that point, the Chino Valley Production Wells is another series of projects. It's uh, dealing with each one of the wells uh, over the next four years, uh, totaling almost $11 million. And so that's part of uh, rehabbing and an existing asset, an existing facility. I have a quick question. In place. Yes, sir. Mr. Craig, are most, most of these items that are on here major project items, <clears throat> are they all rehabilitation, so to speak, or are there any new ones? In other words, is the Chino Valley pump station, is it there and we're just replacing it? Yes, uh, Craig Dosseth, Public Works. Uh, this is a combination of both. Um, rehabbing existing facilities as well as some new. So the Chino Valley um, booster pump station, that's the existing pump station, so it is a replacement of that facility. Um, parts of that facility currently go back to 1947 and 1955. And I wanted the people to hear that because, again, the reason why the rates are going up is because existing infrastructure is now starting to wean and we need to redo it all. Correct. And then there are some other projects like Airport Well 5 and 6. Those would be new water production wells in the airport area, and those will be considered for impact fees as well. Okay. Thank you. Um, without dwelling on each one of the projects, certainly Craig and, and city staff can answer more detailed questions around these, but this is just a highlight, you know, in not just sort of an aggregate dollar amount, as I often look at it when we're looking at big picture at these utilities and financial plans, but uh, breaking it down into uh, projects themselves, and, and as highlighted here, the last one is, is a series of main replacements throughout the city. So a combination of factors, but all in all, what this means is that, uh, you know, the water fund, the amount that's generated through revenues today is insufficient to meet the needs of the fund through the five-year period, uh, which is necessitating the need to adjust user charges and rates. So as w I want to switch focus a little bit uh, into the alternatives, and uh, one, one of the questions, you know, around the alternatives is, you know, they're very similar in, in many regards, but there are a few differences. And so uh, w what this uh, table attempts to highlight is both. So we've got, um, you know, they're generating, designed to generate the same amount of revenue. Uh, the current aquifer protection fee and the alternative water surcharge rate under both these alternatives is uh, proposed to stay the same, not increase uh, those components. The 70 cents or so per month for a, a 5 8 inch customer on the aquifer protection fee and the 89 cent uh, per thousand gallon surcharge for the alternative water volume rate. Those are in place. Uh, both of these uh, alternatives phase to and maintain a customer class cost of service uh, through and by the final year of our rate period or uh, fiscal year 22-23. Uh, both reflect the recommendation and the evaluation in terms of the outside city multiplier that would go from 1.4 to 1.38 times the inside city rates for those customers in the county. Um, and then we start to see some of the differences. And this is really around that idea. And it, yes, I'm sorry, um, I, I'm confused. Um, I, don't, I don't truly understand what is alternative one and what is alternative two. <clears throat> so that's, that's where I'm trying to get to. So that now we cut, like they both handle and, and address many items the same. But when we get to the, the kind of key water rate structure elements, there's a base charge or fixed charge uh, that irrespective of the amount of water use, and then there are volume rates and, and tiers. And that's where they, they get a bit different and they depart. So, um, yes, sir? Yeah, just to take what he had just said and kind of explain it a little better, not no offense to what you said, but. Just, you know, this is the first time we've seen this. Right, so I make it's sure. the idea of almost flatlining it regardless of your level of usage versus bigger steps if you're a bigger consumer. Okay. Right. 
Is that correct? And the, yes. So there is the idea that regardless of your use, um, the steps are consistent in the same size versus if you're a bigger user, there's a jump between the steps of the amount you pay. We already have. This would be making the step. It's okay, bigger. so this is increasing those That's, correct. that's the rates. alternative. That's correct. Okay. Councilman Lamerson. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Blair, help me go back in history. Aquifer protection fee was established by the council to uh, set up a fund capable for um, low interest <clears throat> loans to help people that were in the community on septic tanks um, get into a different level of, of um, quality of the septic tank. Thank you, Mark. Um, the, that was that fund was set up very specifically to help fund a level of um, septic tank that was different than the old style. And the idea was because we needed to protect the aquifer from refuse or whatever you want to call that stuff. And we needed a higher grade septic systems and we set up low interest rate loans using the aquifer prote nice. protection fee and made that available to those people in the city to try and or relate that over to my I'll, I'll be probably uh, disengaged by mr. Woodfield but because of North Prescott sewer district and the leakage we had in a lot of the septic systems within the city of Prescott that aquifer pr protection fee was suggested back when Jim and I were on the water committee with Marlon Kirkendall to have a mechanism through the water bill to be able to provide funds to do something different in the future um, just to clarify s some aspects, there, there was the Water Committee that brought forward a, a recommendation to implement a fee to do something similar to what um, Councilman Lamerson stated. There were a lot of legal issues and problems with that type of thing. The aquifer protection fee was actually put in place during the 2014 study as a way to fund the studies to figure out how to reduce the particulate issues in the waterways, not to fund any loans or anything like that. That came out, that was a recommendation of that committee that went to council and then nothing, no change, nothing was done because there was a lot of legal pro challenges and problems with trying to do uh, what the committee had recommended. It's that ongoing deal where it's taken us five years to get the study done. Right, we're, yeah. the, the aquifer protection fee was put in place, 70 cents per account for the 5 8 cents meter to fund those studies to figure out what we needed to do. So did we accomplish our goal? Yeah, it's still going on. It's well, still going the point, on. The point there being is there's no justification for the 70 cents a month on everybody's water bill, then why do we continue it? There's justification. We're paying for the studies to figure out what we need to do to fix the the uh, waterways and to respond to ADQs. Uh, some of you were on council, you, you were calling 2014. It had to do, uh, partially at least had to do with the water quality in the lakes exactly. and, and, and funding those kinds of studies. <laughs> and so it's, it's a water quality fund and primarily going to studies on how you not only how you either clean up the lakes or prevent them prevent the um, TMDL those kinds of issues from if you recall that total versus load. the sorry the total bacterial load yeah so it was it's re, it's related to the, those issues that were kind of peaking in 2014 we we're dealing with ADQ uh, and we're continuing to do the studies now but it's so so it's it is it is sort of the money's being used and it is sort of justified because obviously the the water quality in the lakes and um, is is continues to be an issue. So uh, that it has it, it has to do with that that br bigger issue, sort of global issue, rather than specific loans to replace some of the things. You made your paycheck this week. Thanks for explaining that, John. There was justification for doing what we yep. did, and it had to do with procuring because of an assured water cir uh, circumstance and all that other stuff that the TMDL. We were addressing that issue when ADEQ said we had to address that issue. And the fact of the matter is the studies are still ongoing, and that's the justification for charging the 70 cents on the water bill. And just for the record, I make my paycheck Yeah, I know you do. And I wasn't arguing that point. I was just saying thank, thank you for set, stepping up to the microphone and explaining. 
here's the justification. Proceed, Andrew. Thanks. Um, so the two alternatives come down to how the fixed revenue through the base charges are covered versus the volume rate. So when we see some numbers, this will play out, and uh, I'm going to highlight those differences uh, a bit more. From a revenue recovery standpoint, the trade-off is guaranteed sort of fixed revenue, both in the base charge irrespective of usage, and then in those sort of winter months or year-round with indoor use for systems like Prescott, um, there's a little more reliability in the first thousand, two thousand, three thousand gallons from each customer. Uh, so there, there's a little bit of a trade-off there. That when you send that signal, uh, then the system's accepting a little more risk. And we're covering more revenue in tiers two, three, and four. And that revenue can be subject to weather and customer behavior patterns. And so it's a little less certain. Um, so this has got a lot of numbers on Let me kind of try and break it down where uh, we've got uh, base charge today, and that's the current column. This uh, is assessed to all customers, and it, it varies based on the size of the water meter. The vast majority of, say, residential customers are 5 8 inch or uh, the base meter size. And so today that charge is $13.69 per month. Under alternative one, we're proposing that to increase, that 2 to 3% a year. Um, so that unit price each year goes up uh, the overall percentage change that's indicated uh, in the last row of the slide. Under alternative two, with the driver being we want to, under this alternative, enhance a conservation signal that uh, we're already sending. So one way that we do that is we put more recovery and more charges on the volume side. So under this alternative, we're maintaining the current base charge as, the, as it is today. It's not increasing in any one of these years, so it's 1369 uh, for the base customer and, and uh, uh, customers with larger meter sizes, a, as you can see. By the final year, the fifth year, uh, the gap is about $2 per month uh, between uh, alternative one base charge and the alternative two base charge. <clears throat> Now the second uh, modification is on the volume side. So both of, between the base and the volume, these are designed to generate the same amount of revenue. And uh, the tiers that are in place were implemented in the last rate study. We're proposing to maintain the sort of amount of volume of water. So the first 3,000 gallons, the next 7,000 gallons, the next 10, or in tier four, uh, above 20,000 gallons per month for single family residential. Um, so these unit prices, you know, $3.21, there, there is a relationship between Tier 2 today to Tier 1. That relationship is Tier 2 is one and a half times Tier 1. Uh, tier 3 is 2.25 times uh, Tier 1. And uh, Tier 4 is, I'm sorry, I spoke, two, two and a half times. Uh, and Tier 4 is four and a half times Tier 1. So as the you know under alternative two the the main change we're making with the volume pricing we're not we're not modifying proposed to modify the amount of water in each tier it's really just increasing that threshold so instead of one and a half times under uh tier two we're proposing to have the tier two be twice as much as tier one and phase to that over a period of time so I don't quite get there until uh the final year um, under uh, tier three, uh, we're, we're proposing under alternative two to increase that to three times instead of um, uh, 2.25 times uh, tier one. And as the final tier, four and a half times is a pretty strong signal, uh, we're proposing to maintain that relationship. But this is where kind of the dynamic comes in. You know, it's a zero sum game. So as we're increasing, say, the unit prices in tier two through tier four, that means we're generating more revenue for that usage, and the tier one price, uh, everything else being equal, equal, can be a little bit lower. And that's where we're questions. seeing this trade-off uh, over time uh, between these two alternatives, if you will. Tier two is how? what volume? Six, uh, it's the uh, next 7,000 7, gallons. So 10,000? 3,000 and one through 10,000 gallons. Right, and tier three is? Uh, 10,000 and one to 20,000 gallons. Now, one of the problems is we haven't really established a uh, usage goal. Uh, I know over the last 10 years, our, our usage has dropped from about 150 gallons per person per day down to about a, 
uh, below 120. So if we establish a goal that we would like to see residents achieve, then our rate structure should be designed around uh, incentivizing um, users to reach that goal. So right now we don't have a goal. We're just focusing on our cost of delivery and then trying to build in some incentive for conservation, correct? That's a fair representation. Really the goal in the industry would be a sort of a water budget. Right. You would essentially tell a customer here is the amount of water that's the efficient amount. And, um, but yes. So if we had a goal and we were able to uh, put together a plan to help residents achieve that goal and monitor their progress towards it um, and either be penalized if they disregarded it and went in the wrong direction or were um, rewarded by making progress towards that goal, um, I think that would be the ideal type of structure. Uh, right now, looking at your rates, um, even at the tier one level, their, their costs uh, are going up. Um, so if we assume that we have 1.6 people per uh, water user uh, at 3,000 gallons, uh, that's about 55, I think, gallons per person per day. Calculate that right. Um, <clears throat> so if we're averaging below 120, um, trying to get to 50 or 60, I think, would be a laudable goal. Uh, f around 50 is the EPA's sort of a super efficient user goal for just indoor. Yeah, so that just gives you a kind of a point of reference that, you know, 50, 55 gallons per capita per day is if you've got a, a very efficient sort of house with devices and you're practicing right. uh, wise water use behavior. Just to clarify, our, our the Department of Water Resources allocation is 115, 115 gallons per person per day in order, in, for safe yield purposes. So that's our, as you recall from the other discussions we've had. So, um, you know, in terms of, of our water resource, you know, we're, we, we let's say we should be comfortable, but per our decision order, 115 a day per person would be the, a, a possible number to look at, but I don't know how Well, I know this uh, previous, uh, gets. the previous page said the average uh, water customer is using 5,000 gallons a month at 1.6 uh, people per, per account. That's 104, so. I guess let me clarify though, the 115 a day on a, it's an average, right. and it also includes commercial uses. So that's so I don't know, I don't know how you would subtract that for for DWR purposes. I don't know if you can subtract out. You know, I mean, I guess we could in theory do we do the numbers, but we are we are meeting that. You know, average person per day. We're we're well we're we're within that number on a on an average basis. For 115. Mm -hmm. But that includes commercial uses, yeah, no, right? That so, skews the. The ability to put together a plan that really addresses our residential the, use. Well, that, that, you that's don't have a DWR to, yeah. issue. But, but you don't have to. T you wouldn't have to tie the stratification of the rate structure to what ADWR is. Where you be, it could be a set aside, totally different. They don't have to be, um, in, in some kind of symbiotic parallel relationship. One's a permitting from ADWR, the other is trying to incentivize well, conservation. Required to do that, uh, but if we want to manage our water resources well, we can establish a plan to do that and then uh, separate commercial from residential so residential users could monitor their, their efforts. And that's what I'd like to see and then be rewarded financially for uh, doing a diligent job there. Um, just just a comment, Councilman Good. Um, you know, definitely always a, a great goal to try to encourage people to be conservation oriented. The problem here is we're not metering people; we're metering houses, right. and you are you are you are encouraging a 1.6 person household to be conservation oriented, which means you're encouraging 
and not that it's bad or good, but uh, somebody with one person in a house is probably going to do very well on the rate structure. But if you have a family of four, you're you're out of luck. I brought up that that concern before. I wouldn't want to penalize uh, families or large families that they may be doing a good job per person. Yeah, but their water bill is going to be substantially higher, and they end up having to pay a premium that I don't think uh, should happen. Right, and which I think that gets you into the the problem with trying to uh, set a rate structure that's so focused on that. I think it's encourage it's important to encourage customers to try to achieve these goals. We you know we do it through education and we do it through water incentives and other things like that. I don't think you can very effectively do it through rates on meters as a house as a whole. I think what you're doing there is you're just kind of making affordability in a community geared toward a certain size household, not towards a family household or something bigger. So I would encourage us to look for better ways to do it than through rates. If we really give it some serious thought. So that's our option is to say, well, we have a fixed cost of delivery and that should be equally shared by every water user. So that's our base rate and then adding a tier structure to either penalize or, or reward um, conscientious use of that water is a, is a second add on it, which I think we've done with our first tier structure. And like I said before, I think we've, if we bumped it up a little bit, there would be more incentive to continue on uh, doing the right thing. And then we'd have to just separate uh, commercial users in some some way so that we could monitor commercial use. Because we're not monitoring that at all right now, right? Well, we monitor everything in finance. Well, but, uh, know, but it's <laughs> just a bill. Yeah. Um, and again, that's what Alternative 2 was established for, was to uh, address your concerns that you expressed back in August, was to kind of keep that that low water user, very small, actually almost nothing of a rate increase um, through this. It's, it's four cents per thousand gallons increase. Um, so that was the goal of alternative two. Alternative one keeps our same stratification that we've had. Um, so th that was essentially the difference between the two tiers. Yeah, but when we get up into tier four, you're either talking about big families or somebody who has a damaged uh, yeah, you're water a, uh, system and they're wasting it. Yeah, you're not talking about big families in tier four. Those are people with lawns. Those are people with damage to their system and that type of thing. And I think that well, the next slide where we look at average the person, then I think, yeah, they should be paying more. Yeah, and, they are, and we don't have a lot of people that hit tier four. Did you, you pull the... It's very small. It's, I, Andrew can correct me, but I think it was like 10% of our usage it hits in tier four, if that. Yeah, I can double check and follow up with that the number. I, I just don't have it at my fingertips, but I, I, I don't even know that it's quite that much. I, yeah, that might even be high. It's very small. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. I, um, so, uh, Mark, have we not? Over the last, I don't know how long the tier system has been in that we have now, we've really conserved well in our city. Yeah, and if you look back at water consumption and water pumping, you can tell when we adopted this aggressive, very aggressive it, well, industry standard tier system um, to encourage conservation, we had a significant conservation. It was uh, probably close to 10 years ago now, right. and you can see... 2006, 12 years okay. time. <laughs> um, and you can see the, the pumping requirements in, in our well field go down as, as this went into well, place. Well, our gross usage is exactly what it was 10 years ago, plus or minus, correct? So, if you so I guess to my question well, is, if, if it's not broken, why fix it? If, if we have a tier system that is working, and it seems to be working, and quite well, um, why would we go through, through restriction and, and possibly have unintended consequences on other people that when we have, what we have is working well. I don't understand why we would restru restructure everything. Well, and Councilman, great, great um, 
uh, observation. I mean, there's other ways to encourage conservation that's right. through conservation efforts. And I think that's really going to see where, where you see more effectiveness of it. The, the rates are just too, I mean, we can't monitor people in a household um, in utility billing and try to bill a tier based on the number of people in a household because that fluctuates constantly. Um, obviously, if we're rewarding low water users, we're rewarding people that are using very little, but they could be using very little because there's one person in the house right. or there's two people in the house or it's they're not their primary home and they're only here on weekends or things like that. Um, so, uh, and again, uh, we brought it forward because it was brought up at the earlier council meeting as something you wanted to look at. Staff would recommend alternative one okay. uh, because that's a continuation of the, of the structure we put in place. Um, but we wanted to bring an option because, of course, council is the final deciding factor in this. I guess it, it just seems to me that our citizens have done a phenomenal job of conserving. And then now we're going to ask you to do a little bit more and tighten that noose a little. I don't know. It just seems that's not the way to to uh, show appreciation and to reward when now we're going to make it even a little bit harder for everybody. I, I'm just concerned about creating a, another system when we've done really good with the system that we have. This Can is my I, two cents. Oh, I'm sorry. No, that's good. Councilman Lamerson. Thank you, uh, Mayor Mangarelli. At the end of the day, I'm going to echo Billy a little bit. If it isn't broke, don't fix it. And I want to uh, share a little bit of respect for the accolades of city manager down there. At the end of the day, you know, we've done a lot of good things here. And you know what? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. And I really respect what you had to say. The community has done a great job of stepping up, doing what we need to do. And the citizens of Prescott are doing a much better job of managing our water than any place in the state of Arizona. Right. You know, and I get tired of hearing all the rhetoric about what we're not doing rather than what we are doing. And what we have done is a lot of good things. That's correct. And, and Mayor, can I clarify? <clears throat> our allocation is actually 150, 150, not 115. Our use is 115 per person. So we're well below our our uh, safe yield numbers. And the other thing I think it has been mentioned before is that we, we um, put back in the ground more last year more water than we took out with the combination of reclaimed water and our surface water. So our net, you know, removal of water from groundwater was zero. Or, you know, or, so I think your point, Mayor Pro Tem, is well taken that, you know, the, the, the community here uh, the users do really, really well we for water conservation purposes and use sort of the minimal amounts. And, and uh, I mean, I was probably a tier three or four at one point because I had a broken pipe. But, you know, so those things spike. And right. you get hit for sometimes thousands of dollars. I was only hit for, you know, hundreds. But it hurts, <laughs> you know, on those, right. on those months where sometimes, you know, things happen, something breaks, you don't realize it. So it is, I think your, your point's good. Is you know, you know is well taken that those tier fours, particular threes, are not. I, I I doubt they're consistent users, you know, across the board. And so you said that we've put more into the system. Take our reclaimed water plus right. our surface water and and re, um, what's the word? <coughs> Recharge. Recharge. Thank back you. Twenty seven. Yeah. Last year was was basically we we put back in as much as we took out when you total it all up. So in the city of Prescott, we actually have reached safe yield. In twenty seventeen. Twenty seventeen. Thank you. That's not the measurement of safe yield. We're, we're, yes, we are within well within our safe yield. What we remove at one fifteen is below the one fifty we're allowed to under our decision order. But our the in, in for all in practical terms we. We recharged as much water last year as we took out when you add our surface water recharge plus our reclaimed water recharge. Great. Thank well, you, John. And you know, one of the things I think is important to consider too, uh, this is more of a stick approach and there's nothing wrong with the stick approach, but there's a carrot approach right. that I have seen documentation that is as successful or even more successful, things like um, shower head handouts. You know, I, I, those are the kinds of things, if you're really looking at conservation, that we should consider for budgeting next year. Um, 
they could be more impactful without actually being a stick. It's more of a carrot. So that's just something to think about if you don't do some alternative um, structuring or stratification. Councilman Sishka. Thanks, Mayor. I think we ought to uh, pay close attention to, uh, we, we need to be careful about what we wish for. We may just get it because I think that there's a certain amount of water that needs to go through the system. Right. Is that right? Yep. So if you can serve so much, then all of a sudden you are, are um, putting your wastewater system at, at risk. And so, you know, I think that, that what Councilwoman Orr said is, is, is very pertinent for now. I think we've done a remarkable job of conserving just with what we've been doing. Are we still setting the rates for though, for uh, fresh water off the wastewater? How are they working that now? I know they had a phone call to me that that oh. my water my water use went way up because I had a leak, and they called and asked me if it was because of my watering, if it was outside, or if it was inside. Yes, uh, we use winter uh, winter average uh, October through April average to set the sewer usage. And um, we, we, we look, we spend a lot of time analyzing so we don't penalize people for outside watering if we see it. You've been in your place a long time. If, if this year was a lot different than your other year, you're going to get a call. And I, the point I'm bringing up is I appreciate that. And the customer does as well because if you see a real high spike and you call them and ask, hey, did you have a leak? And you say, yeah, we had a leak, it's fixed. Then we shouldn't be penalized for that. Yeah, and we and we reduce your average that you'll pay the next twelve months for those when we can find them. <laughs> Councilman Good. Well, I'd just like to uh, say that yeah, I think putting the uh, tiered rate structure in twelve years ago was a great idea, and it's proved to be to be valuable. Um, that doesn't mean that we've picked the ideal perfect rate structure, and we should never change it. Uh, we are going through significant growth, and for those people who have adopted uh, good water use, they're not going to be penalized in any way. Um, their rates would probably be pretty much the same. Um, but for those who want to go and do more, I'd like to see them rewarded for doing more. And for those who um, are relocating here from areas where water is not a concern, and they decide they want to recreate their own uh, previous landscaping, uh, they should be uh, very aware when they see their water bill that those types of choices when it comes to landscaping and, and uh, plant and, and uh, shrubbery and other selections uh, are probably not appropriate when it comes to their costs, and they can make a better choice um, to keep their rates uh, reasonable and low. So, you know, there's no, no denying that we're growing and we wanna make sure that we do the best job we can with the resources that we have for as long as we have. Um, so I think uh, providing some additional incentives is not gonna hurt anybody and it's gonna help those who wanna do more and uh, it'll get the attention of the people who are not using water efficiently. So uh, I think the alternate two is, um, is a good step in that improving direction. Thank you, Mayor. Yep, uh, go ahead, Andrew. <clears throat> so uh, on the point of comparing these two alternatives, this gives an idea in terms of different users. And so what we're looking at is the current bill for a single family residential customer in different months or different user profiles, including ones that um, pretty rare, but uh, in that sort of upper tier, if you will. And so this shows, you know, a 3,000 gallon customer, kind of an, a typical winter bill, or a 5,000 gallon, a, a typical annual water bill, uh, what those amounts are today and, and this trade off. Under alternative two, whether it's in 19 or 2023, the uh, by design, the lower volume user's bill isn't increasing as much, or you know, in some cases, they're pretty flat. And then as the alternative to that sort of tiered relationship, as you use more and the higher tiers, then the gap between those two uh, increases over time. And that's, you kind of see that playing out. And so it's, it, it uh, 
both provides the bill impact as well as just this kind of trade-off that uh, revenue stability versus pricing signal or council member goods, you know, uh, the way you phrased it, sort of this reward, if you will, for, for lower users. Um, so this, you know, as we were asked to look at uh, more uh, conservation-oriented alternative, we kind of put that together. So we're looking at the bills if they would go in effect in March and then five years out and kind of the final year of the transition period, if you will. Okay, Councilman Lamerson has a question, comment? I didn't have a question per se. I had a comment and a question. Um, Andy, thank you. Um, I agree with Councilman Gooden, some, some reference to going back in time frame. Thank you for the compliment there, Mr. Good, when we adjusted our water rates mm -hmm. and we reduced the water consumption significantly. Um, thank you, Mr. Blair, for being here at the time. And, uh, you know, we took a lot of lip service we were doing what we had to do to try and reduce the water consumption in an attempt to reach a unrealistic goal stated by the state of Arizona reaching safe yield. But at the end of the day, we're using less water. I think I just heard either the manager or the attorney say we're using less water today than we were using 10 years ago. And at the end of the day, the people who've done that isn't up here. It's the citizens of Prescott. Mm -hmm. And the fact of the matter is, you know, we've increased the population of the city dramatically over the last 10 years and we're using half the water and there's a reason for that and it's called conservation and it's called appropriate use of water so I guess the point I was trying to make there is that I appreciate why you're here and you're reiterating circumstances of what we've done I think it's important for the community to hear you've done a good job You've done a real good job, City of Prescott, at doing what we were assigned to do, and that was to reduce our water consumption, which we have. It's a limited resource. And City Manager, your job is to make sure that the citizens of the City of Prescott knows it all the time. You know, we, we take a lot of riffraff out there, and we take a lot of shots for Prescott being the ill of all the planet because we're going to make everybody dry up and float away when indeed we're the only people in the AMA who's reached safe yield. Yes, we are at the forefront of water conservation, not just in the AMA, but in the state of Arizona. Thank you, and we need to hear that all the time. The city of Prescott, where it all began for the state of Arizona, has demonstrated the leadership role that we took on many years ago. We have obtained our ability to put as much water, in fact more, back in than we took out. Nobody else in the state of Arizona can claim that. Only the city of Prescott. Thank you, Councilman Lamerson. Good point. Go ahead. <clears throat> so uh, switching gears uh, to the wastewater fund. And uh, as we look at uh, rate alternative, we're proposing uh, one alternative. Um, similar rate objectives to the extent that, you know, leveling uh, the adjustments, avoiding sharp uh, increases, uh, providing a stable source of revenue to fund the needs of the system, including capital projects and, and uh, existing and, and anticipated debt service, and maintaining the customer class cost of service uh, rate recovery philosophy the city's had for a number of years. Um, so, you know, kind of looking at the across the board adjustment, uh, similar kind of dynamic where um, the percentage needs or increases are slightly higher over time over the five-year period in wastewater relative to water and we see this play out a, a bit but uh, for a typical user in this case that 3,000 gallons of winter period use uh, as market indicated uh, how the volume is, is billed for a residential customer uh, we're looking at about a dollar a year and uh, as it increases a bit it gets a little closer to with rounding uh, approaches uh, two dollars uh, I'm sorry, a month for a typical customer. Uh, there's there's quite a bit less variation on the wastewater side, as you may imagine. You know, it's more on the indoor water use, so get a little less of the lawns, and with uh, winter period use driving it, uh, there's there's less outdoor discretionary water. Uh, and and just another question. Yes, sir. Okay, is it reasonable to um, assume, and I hate assumptions, but is it reasonable to assume that the delivery for the cost of water for the citizens of Prescott via having to pay for the maintenance 
on our pipes and the maintenance on our systems, etc., along with the cost of bringing the water in, has gone up a dollar a year? I, I mean, that yes, and I, on average, that, yeah. That's my point. Yeah. I think the citizens need to hear loud and clear our costs continually go up, okay? The cost to bring their water to their tap is a dollar more a year, or a dollar more a month, or a dollar more a week, or whatever the case is. Here's the deal, guys. To bring you the water that you use every day, here's what it costs. Or to take that water away and, and treat it and meet uh, state and federal regulations. And so that, that's that been a driver in the wastewater fund. It continues to be. The, the previous study five years ago, uh, the city was embarking on a pretty significant set of wastewater capital projects. That has continued, but it, it's the idea that um, uh, consolidating down to a single treatment plan. So there, there are improvements in this five-year period. You know, uh, we aggregated the dollar amount, uh, a little less than water, but $67 million in just aggregate capital. And much of that is, as we look at the major projects, it's around um, getting, you know, the size of the mains uh, sufficient so that when there's uh, one water reclamation facility uh, in about six years, uh, the, the infrastructure is there to support it. Um, you know, I won't rehash history, but I mean, certainly the city has evaluated this uh, subject and, and, you know, the idea of maintaining two treatment plants was much more expensive. So while we look at the outcome of a very deliberate, uh, uh, intentional process that also results in an increasing, say, rate in this case, um, you know, kind of in hindsight, we don't, we didn't head down the path of maintaining two plants, which would have, uh, in hindsight, you know, put us in a position where we'd need more money than we're asking for today. So that's always the, the tricky part of, you know, we've kind of made that decision and the city's been heading in that path. And I'd like to make a comment is that that rate is almost identical to the current rate of inflation, 2.8%, which is a dollar on $36 as a base. So I think that's pretty easily justified and understandable by uh, our customers and our citizens that inflation does cost um, our operations, and that's an eminently reasonable number. Thanks. <clears throat> Good question. Craig, another question, because I think it's important. This council made a decision, other councils, to put our both of our uh, reclamation facilities into one. Do you have an idea about how much the city will save by only operating one plant and have everything centralized? I know that's a tough number because we I, haven't run the... I had that number several years ago. I don't today. Um, but in regards to their, like, airport phase two, second bullet from the bottom at $18.8 if we didn't do that, we would be replacing or upsizing Sundog, and the dollar value on that was about $59 million, okay. to give you a comparison there. So this community is saving roughly over $30 million in doing in rates and, and adjustments because of what we've done. Correct. Thank you. And remember, too, just on that, Mayor, is that <coughs> the centralization <coughs> is also, it, it's not just the savings. It's, I think Andrew mentioned, it, it, there's regulatory requirements by ADEQ that, that are sort of pushing mm -hmm. that, too. So it is sort of these external factors that are coming in to affect or to create the necessity to, to uh, centralize. Sometimes we call those unfunded mandates, John. <laughs> Mayor Pro Tem? Yes, Craig, could I ask a question? Because Steve brought up, Shiska brought up <clears throat> the idea that you need water in order to do this system. I mean, you need, have we ever gotten so low in the use of water that we were concerned about our wastewater facility? Yes. And Billy, we broke the pooper. <laughs> when when we went into conservation mode and we, we didn't have enough water going through the system. I, re I remember something right, about I'm that. I'm just sharing with you, we created millions of dollars worth of damage. It, it has changed our process. Uh, we are not having trouble with as far as enough water to convey um, the product down the okay. collection system. That was really diplomatic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it can be when, a mess. <laughs> When, when it comes, when it comes to the the Sundog wastewater treatment plant or the airport water reclamation facility, yes, we've seen significant difference in the concentration of the water that that gets to the facilities, and that's that's the change at at Sundog. 
Sundog is capable of handling 6 million gallons a day of water. But today, because of the concentration change, it's only capable of handling 3 million gallons of the concentration of water that comes into it. So from when it was originally designed to today, it essentially has a capacity of half of, of the original design. The airport water reclamation facility, we have designed it to handle and manage the higher concentration of water that we are getting today. Okay, thank As you. well as we have conservative in um, in our design to so if it continues to get stronger yet our design has considered that going forward okay thank you uh, Andrew I'm gonna ask the council if they can hold questions and if you can get through this uh, rest of the presentation quickly I want to make sure you have time for public comment and a little break before three o'clock so okay. go fast <laughs> um, much more simple kind of dynamic on the wastewater side. This uh, puts on a chart the proposed option, and uh, we're looking at uh, maintaining and keeping the monthly service charge the same and adjusting the volume rates. Uh, essentially, there's two sets of users. Uh, right now, the city had historically kind of collapsed. Many Arizona communities had up to 30 or 40. Uh, we're now down to residential, non-residential, and septic haulers, or those external uh, entities that, that discharge a, a very highly concentrated uh, wastewater uh, effluent. So this is, you know, the proposed uh, rate, uh, rates, if you will, uh, designed to generate 3 to 4% additional revenue each year uh, over the uh, period. And that's incremental, you know, kind of accumulates, if you will. Uh, in terms of... The impacts, you know, uh, we use three, five, and sevens a little bit on the high side. You've got to be a pretty uh, big user uh, to discharge 7,000 gallons or, or uh, inefficient or maybe even a leak. Uh, this just gives an idea of, you know, typical user. We're looking at a uh, dollar a month initially, and just as that accumulates out five years, uh, that difference is about $6.50 in aggregate five years out. And uh, similar trade-off, uh, you know, 5,000, 7,000 increases a bit uh, when you're a larger wastewater user or a residential user in this case. Uh, but it just gives an idea of different users and how they may be uh, impacted. Um, now, the, the question that often comes up is uh, how do we compare? And while, as throughout this discussion, uh, Prescott has, is a unique community with a unique set of challenges, whether it goes back to some of the water pumping restrictions or just the age of the community itself. Um, so as much as this question does come up, uh, we generally it's very difficult to compare one community to the other. With that said, um, we've put together water and wastewater bills for typical residential customers. And you can see sign in the middle, whether it's the current or either alternative, um, you know, Prescott would be in a similar spot. Now, certainly would be going up a bit, uh, but very similar to Cottonwood. And in the case of Chino Valley, and Cottonwood does this as well on the wastewater side, uh, they've made a choice. They, they charge a flat amount. They don't have a volumetric component of their bill. And certainly Chino Valley had been, you know, five years ago, was updating a similar comparison, $58. So they continue to have cost increases, but they just have a flat amount. So there isn't a variation. You have 1,000, 10,000, it's still a flat charge. And uh, so we're seeing that a bit. Uh, but in general, you know, Prescott Valley on the kind of the lower end, and I think a couple of components there, I mean, the topography, the geography of the city is, is a bit unique and does uh, is, is capitals driving and while it's regulations at one hand um but also uh we're replacing a lot of pipes a lot of older infrastructure and uh, so that kind of trade-off i think prescott valley at some point in the future they're going to be playing uh catch up as uh, their infrastructure starts to age so with that uh that's really the kind of end of the, my prepared slides and uh thank you very good uh questions comments from the council Good spot. There's a lot of good news out there in regard to our water usage, I would agree. And it was stated earlier that we are one of the leaders in the state for conservation. And I think that's very obvious when you see uh, that we're at 115 gallons per person per day. And uh, ADWR allows us 150 per person per day. Uh, that's something to brag about, as well as all the growth we've seen over the last 10 or more years. And our water usage has flatlined. 
Uh, and that's something, again, to brag about, never mind the fact that we have uh, last year more put into the aquifer than we took out. So those are all great bullet points and I think uh, great decisions in the past by our previous council. And most importantly, as Councilman Lamerson pointed out, we have citizens who are very conscientious and want to conserve water. And so I'm glad we have those uh, opportunities to reward those people that do that. Uh, if there's no questions or comments from the council, we'll go to public comment. Let me remind the public, you have three minutes. You're addressing the council, and this is uh, your opportunity for your thoughts and comments. If you have questions, please direct those to appropriate staff after the meeting. The first speaker is Fred Oswald. Thank you. Uh, Fred Oswald, 1520 Magnolia Lane. Uh, I'm one of your conserving users. My wife and I use about 1,200 to 1,300 gallons a month, which is about 20 to 21 gallons each a day, which is one of their lower users. Um, I'm concerned about the conservation signal, and from the presentation, it, it looks like I would favor alternative two very strongly. Uh, in fact, I w if I were doing it, I would go further. Um, the, um, the you have a, f a four and a half times uh, ratio between tier one and tier four, and I've done a little study of, of some of our neighboring communities, and Prescott is the leader <coughs> that way. Uh, Prescott Valley, for example, has only a one and a quarter uh, ratio, but um, uh, so what's the town by the San Francisco Peaks? Uh, Flagstaff. Flagstaff, right. Flagstaff is close to Prescott in, in terms of the water rates for, for heavy users versus light users. Um, but I'm, I'm concerned about the, the conservation signal in the water rates, uh, especially for a light user like me, there's not much of a signal. Uh, looking at my recent water uh, bills, 80 to 85 percent of uh, the bill has been fixed charges and only 15 to 20 percent has been based on usage. So I would like to encourage to get the uh, fixed charges lower and the um, variable charges higher. And uh, again, alternative two better addresses, but I would like you to go further. Thank you. Thank you. The next one is Leslie Hoy. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council, and thank you for the interesting presentation. As you know, um, conservation is dear to my heart, and I do agree that we've done a great job in Prescott. However, the, there's room to improve, and I hope that we don't give the public a signal that we don't have room to improve. Um, this morning on Councilman Blair's show, I heard that our population is expect, expected to reach 80,000 eventually. And if we're going to reach 80,000, I won't be here, thank goodness. Um, <laughs> it's really important that we think about people in the future and so we can't stop conserving. Water is a finite supply, no matter how great technology is, um, unless they be determine a way that we can reuse every drop and that's not too likely. Um, we do really need to think about the future when we're conserving. Um, I think it's, Unfortunate that we can no longer ask any questions at council, but I'll throw these out in case a council person would be interested in asking these. Um, I noticed the category in the volume chart for non-residential, um, and I don't know what that is, if that's commercial, but the rates are lower than they are for residential, so it would be great if someone would ask why that is. Um, and my other question, I'm wondering about is whether rates for effluent were included anywhere in these studies and whether the rates for effluent are going up. And um, if nobody's going to ask these questions, would it be possible to know who the appropriate staff person is to I approach? would start with Mr. Woodfill. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's it? Any other questions, comments from the council at this point? Yeah, I, I, I just want to say I agree with Leslie in the fact that um, we're talking about conservation. We had this good discussion at our 
at our water group, and I think it is uh, with through uh, the Contractors Association, the irrigation groups out there, the landscapers, that they get together with their higher volume customer and do an assessment of their irrigation systems and make sure that they're the top of the art and they're not leaking, they're not spraying concrete. There's ways to save water, and if we don't pay any attention to it, then we'll never save any more. But I think that commercial use focus needs to be high on the plate for this next year for our water users. Good point. Um, Councilman Lamerson. Thank you. Um, it's just a question. I don't understand why everybody doesn't pay the same price for water. A gallon of water is a gallon of water. So I'm just laying that out there. It's a question. Maybe at some point in the future we can get that explained, why we would sell water to uh, J.C. Penney's differently by the gallon than we would to Steve Shiska. Just, just sharing it to you. <laughs> Councilman Good. Yeah, I'd just like to state again that um, even Alternate 2 is a very modest uh, change in rates, and it would send a signal to the community that the council is concerned about conservation. They are taking steps to uh, uh, create uh, a better incentive to um, conserve without without doing anything drastic. So uh, sometimes just that message can be enough to get people to um, engage in, in appropriate conservation measures and uh, uh, I'm not advocating anything drastic. It's just a very modest improvement. Thanks. Any other questions or comments? All right, this meeting is adjourned. We'll see you at 3 o'clock. <laughs>